welcome, welcome, welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Hello to our friends around the world that are watching the Facebook live stream. And I'm telling you, I don't think it could be a prettier day outside of these windows, for goodness sakes. It's incredibly, incredibly uh, beautiful time. Uh, to give us a, another welcome, an official welcome, uh, we're in the company of our Vice Commodore, our great senator himself. Come on up, Bill Dana. Thank you, Ron. Um, I do definitely want to uh, also uh, welcome the Coast Guard and Vessel Assist. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, and whenever we have an event out here, whether it's Big Boat Series or a Dengue Regatta, we're always communicating with them to keep everyone coordinated. And, um, and I've been on the on the VHF radio with them myself, and uh, I haven't been run over yet, and uh, I don't think anyone else has either. So you guys do a great service. So uh, so welcome. We're looking forward to your presentation. On, um, <coughs> on the... Uh, thank you. On the uh, accomplishment front, um, woke up this morning and uh, checked the news, and I'm happy to report uh, one of my good friends and our fellow member, Pete Cunningham, won the Caribbean 600 line honors on his Mod 70 uh, in just uh, under 48 hours. Huge accomplishment. So uh, big applause for uh, the, the crew of Power Play and, uh, and, and Pete Cunningham. Uh, and by the way, I think he's 77 or 78 years old, out there ripping around the Caribbean on a 70-foot trimaran. So, uh, God bless him for that. So, all right, turn it back over to you, Ron. Thank you, Billy. Thanks, bud. We still here on this? Yes. Uh, nextly, we want to introduce um, uh, a good colleague and a partner. The president of the Navy League is here. Say hello to Angus Blackwood. Angus, take a bow. Thank you. We're very happy for the speakers that the very happy for the speakers the Navy League is sending us, and will continue to send us. So, that's terrific. Um, also, uh, how many people went to the stag cruise this last year? Okay. Uh, if you went to stag cruise, you saw an amazing colors. We have not seen, uh, I don't know what that sound is. We've not seen colors like this ever before. Many times on Saturday when we'll have colors, we'll have, uh, flat, we'll have good, thoughtful military folks uh, bring a flag down from the flagpole. Um, that's terrific. But in this particular case, um, instead of coming down the flagpole, we had um, uh, a different kind of a process. And the organizer of that process, a veteran himself of more than 100 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, three tours of Iraq and Afghanistan, is also here with us. Mikhail Venikoff, stand up and take a bow, please. Mikhail Venikoff. <laughs> Mikhail, you, you're familiar with... Uh, Navy SEALs and Army Rangers, there's a competition among all special forces from each of the different um, branches of the military. Mikhail and his partner won worldwide best Ranger uh, uh, Ranger One competition. So that's terrific. They, they have to travel. They have to travel 100 miles in three days. They have to commandeer forms of transportation. They have to use multiple time forms of. Uh, multiple kinds of weapon systems and be double crossed and tricked as part of the war games and they literally won. Well, in order to have a really great uh, colors, we pro we produce this colors. Mikhail and I dreamed this up and so just imagine you're in Tinsley and here it is. Screen, Eric. No, hold it, hold it, hold it. I want to make sure this is on the right screen here, boys. No, 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 hold on, just a second, here we go, I, I don't want the sound yet, I want to basically change to this screen right here, holy moly, yeah, that's the screen, so Eric, can you get that screen on the big screen, Ranger Road image please? <laughs> yes, the Navy League thanks you for this great delay. We get this image on the big screen. Bobby. Hold on here. You're going to like this. Hold on. I know what to do here. Is that...
Good heavens. Okay. Yes, technical delay. Can close this. Thank you, Eric. Okay. How do we get that image on there? That's youngster. You know that. I know it's open a close power point here. Close power point. Now, do you want to just want this light? Yes, they probably could. Here we go. Save. Here. Here we go. Okay. We have sound, Eric?
Thanks, Mikhail, and all the guys at Ranger Road made our stag cruise all the more fun. A uh, little bit about future speakers. Um, you may have heard that our own Paul Kayard, currently chairman of the board of the Yacht Club, became the first sailor inducted to the Bay Area Hall of Fame. He'll be by to tell the story on May 27th. Uh, on May 13, Jack Griffin, editor of Cup Experience, will be here to preview the America's Cup. On May 6th, Don Martin, Commodore of the Single-Handed Sailing Society, will be by to talk about the largest yacht race in the world, which is produced in San Francisco Bay called the Three Bridge Fiasco. They're doing. Uh, CJ uh, Co. will be here in um, uh, April to talk all about Baykeeper and their incredible activities to keep the bay a clean place. She's the executive director of that. Um, also in April, uh, Moss Landing Marine Lab will be here to talk about what they're doing to keep the Pacific Coast clean. Mike Martin, Adam Lowry, the newest additions to the Rolex uh, Hall of Fame, Yachtsman of the Year, will be here um, in April. Kevin Kelly will talk about the modern uh, world of bottom cleaning, the old world where they would go down there with the brushes passed up now with all kinds of online tools and videos when you get your bottom clean, you look at the latest devices and how they, they work on the bottom. Uh, Jim Hancock, founder of the Science Sailing Center will be by in April. Chuck Adams, one-time owner of the Pittsburgh uh, Penguins will be here about his book about the making of the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, Will Stokely, a director of recruitment for the Clipper Around the World race will be here in March. You can talk about taking a ride on a Around the World race. And um, on March the 4th, just they just introduced Mikhail Vinikov will be here to talk all about Ranger Road, the veterans organization made up of people who lost a limb, an arm, a leg, or an eye, or some combination thereafter, and still want to challenge themselves. They've created a new thing called Ranger Road Sailing. I'm happy to say they've been sailing on Youngster, and they do amazing things like you just saw. Now a little bit about our uh, our today's speaker, our current speaker. So as a little boy in 1957, out these windows in the sea scat boat called Ranger, we were sailing along just fine, a bunch of us with like one adult on board and like 15 boys when we swamped the Ranger. 30 foot whale boat over and inside, filled up with water. There we were, it floated so we were safe, but it was cold. Well, we turned the boat around, headed it that way when it's in the water and a, a, a cutter, a Coast Guard cutter came along, throw us a hawser bigger than any of our arms, and we wrapped it around the mast carefully and delicately uh, with a couple of extra lines that we could release if we wanted to, so we made a bridle around the mast, and they started pulling us to the east, and we, as Sea Scout kids, got inside the boat, bailed it out with buckets. Gradually, as it came back up, uh, we emptied it, and they let go of us someplace this side of Aquatic Park. So we, it's not an overstatement to say, and of course, how many of us had life jackets on in 1957? Zero. Zero. None of us had life jackets. Yes, the boat floated, and yes, I'm not saying we would have drowned right away, but we would have been much colder when we got back to the Seas Cat Base were it not for the good services of the Coast Guard. In those days, they had to pay attention to Sea Scout kids and yachtsmen. Nowadays, our speaker today will talk about the broadened mission of the Coast Guard. Our speaker today was an FJ sailor as a young uh, collegiate. She went to the Coast Guard Academy and um, is, you know, has been spending tons and tons of time of time on the water, but she doesn't go out recreation like we do. She goes out with an incredible mission. Who stops a container ship with a bomb in the hull from letting it off under the Golden Gate Bridge? Who stops drug interdictors who want to come into our port and exchange drugs, you know, get them back on land? Who is the first line of military defense of our coastline all around America? It is our speaker today in charge of the San Francisco region, which goes from here to Utah and up to Oregon and down to San Luis Obispo. Please welcome the very much acclaimed captain of the Port of San Francisco for the U.S. Coast Guard, Marie Bird.
Hi, good afternoon, and thank you so much, Vaughn, for that very kind introduction, and thank you to the St. Francis Yacht Club for having me today and inviting me uh, to be here to speak, and for all of you here being present to learn about, you know, your United States Coast Guard at Sector San Francisco. And the way I want to kind of set up this you know, presentation is kind of discuss our very unique area of responsibility, uh, the outstanding professionals that are part, that make up Sector San Francisco, as well as the authorities that are entrusted into me and invested in me and as expected to carry out as Sector Commander. Oh, okay. Oh, so the, the, the audience can't see the slides. Oh, okay. I just don't know because it's easier for me to for to refer to uh, a graphic so as you know if I'm describing our Perfect. area of responsibility okay Perfect. great um, and then are we able to make the screen where um, you can see the whole thing I mean so for our area of responsibility extends 200 nautical miles seaward and then goes as far inland to cover lakes and rivers into Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming. Uh, we're responsible for 585 miles of coastline, California coastline, and it begins the uh, same northern border as uh, Sonoma's northern, Sonoma County's northern border, which is in the vicinity of Gualala Point, and then extends uh, 585 miles to the south to the same southern border as Monterey County, and that's in the vicinity of Salmon Creek Falls. And um, the, oh, it also includes uh, 2,500 miles of shoreline, which is all the shoreline of San Francisco Bay, and then along the Sacramento River into the Port of Sta uh, Sacramento, and then of course the San Joaquin River into the Port of Stockton. Uh, the, to, okay, for, this area, I mean, it includes three national marine sanctuaries, uh, Cordell Bank, Gulf of the Farallons, as well as Monterey Bay. And so this extensive area is larger than the state of Rhode Island. And so to cover all of this, I mean, I have the privilege to lead over 800 active duty Coast Guardsmen and Coast Guards women, uh, reservists and civilians, and then as well as over 1,500 auxiliaries or uh, volunteers that work towards uh, helping us achieve Coast Guard uh, missions and responsibilities. Okay. So I, I don't. Hopefully, the way would fix where you know we'll be able to get to see the whole screen, or I'll do my best to kind of get to a, a bit of it. Or you know what? I think if I do it this way. Oh, there, that'll work, okay. All right, so for this uh, area of responsibility, yeah, so I think that'll catch it. For this area of responsibility, so Coast Guard Sector San Francisco is located at Yerba Buena Island, and that's where the command center is, and that's also where our vessel traffic service is. And so um, for our vessel traffic service, that's where vessels greater than 300 gross tons check into the traffic system and receive information to aid uh, with safe navigation. And then also at Yerba Buena Island is two of our four 87-foot patrol boats, the Pike and the Turn, as well as one of our seven uh, stations, uh, Station San Francisco, and then as well as Ace Navigation Team San Francisco. And Ace Navigation Team San Francisco is responsible for maintaining over a thousand aids, uh, the buoys, fix aids, including the lighthouses. For Sector San Francisco, we have 13 subunits. So there are seven stations, four patrol boats, the ACE navigation team, and also a marine safety detachment in Humboldt Bay. And I'll explain um, Humboldt Bay's uh, relationship to Sector San Francisco. And then um, if this gives a perspective, there's only 13 small boat stations in the state of California and over half of them, seven of them, come fall under Sector San Francisco. And then the rest of our stations are throughout our um, uh, AOR uh, from Station Bodega Bay, Golden Gate, uh, Monterey, Vallejo, Rio Vista, and Lake Tahoe. And then our other two patrol boats are 
won the sockeye at Bodega Bay and, and the fourth one, the Hawksbill at Monterey. And so for each of the small boat stations, there's a complement of small boats that are commensurate with the type of sea state that they'll encounter. And then for specifically for station Bodega Bay, station Golden Gate and station Monterey, they have our 47 foot motor lifeboats. And those are our self riding boats and they're meant to withstand uh, to operate in winds of up to 50 knots, seas up to 30 feet, and surf up to 20 feet. Okay. We have two air stations that help us uh, execute our missions. So we have, we receive helicopter support from air station San Francisco, which is located at San Francisco International Airport, and they provide support via the H-65 Dolphins, and then Air Station Sacramento provider fixed wing support via the C-27J Spartans. Okay, so I know that you all know because you're sailing on the bay, but you understand that San Francisco Bay, I mean, this is this is just a snapshot, not including, you know, Tahoe and Monterey and Bodega Bay, but uh, our uh, operational tempo here is extremely high. Uh, we're the lead federal agency for uh, any, for safety, security, and stewardship in the maritime environment. Uh, many people depend on the marine transportation system for commerce, for commuting, for national defense, and for recreation. This slide identifies the seven major ports, five refineries, a military outload facility, and a sample of the 14 ferry terminals that all rely on the use of the marine transportation system in the San Francisco Bay. Safe and secure navigation is the responsibility of Sector San Francisco and we facilitate the movement of commerce on the water to support the local and national economy. So for example, the Port of Oakland loads and discharges 99% of the containerized goods moving through Northern California. According to a Port of Oakland report, the total economic value of the seaport region is measured at $60.3 billion. The Port of Stockton is crucial to California's Central Valley billion dollar agricultural industry. Over 90% of the fertilizer used to grow Central Valley crops comes through the Port of Stockton. The Port of Sacramento is the second largest exporter of rice in the nation. The five refineries in the Bay Area account for approximately 10% of the refining capacity of the United States. The Military Ocean Terminal in Concord supports Department of Defense Pacific Command and is critical to our national defense as the second largest ammunition seaport in the world. There are 14 ferry terminals located around the bay that services over five and a half million passengers annually. We have the third largest ferry system in the United States. And lastly, Sector San Francisco permits over a thousand marine events annually, more than any other sector in the Coast Guard. So that includes many of the sailing regattas, swims from Alcatraz, any fireworks displays that originate from the water. So as you can tell, the Bay and the Delta is a unique and dynamic operating environment. Sector San Francisco ensures that those that need access to the precious marine transportation system can operate and recreate in a safe and secure manner. So this is a snapshot from our vessel traffic system that shows all automatic identification system registered vessel traffic in and out of San Francisco Bay in a single day. On average, every day there's approximately 420 reg AIS registered vessel movements. AIS is required for vessels 1,600 gross tons or more. So for 420, every single time a ferry leaves from one terminal to the next, they check in with our uh, vessel traffic service. And so including the ferry uh, movements, the deep draft vessel movements, and then any of the sightseeing vessels, such as the transportation to and from Alcatraz Island. And that's just the ones that are required to check in with VTS, right? So it's a very busy bay. So before sectors, the Coast Guard was organized regionally into groups and marine safety offices. Each had responsibility for the same geographic area depending on a mission. So for example, groups were responsible for search and rescue and for law enforcement. And then the marine safety offices were responsible. They had captain of the port authority and responsible for commercial vessel inspections and responding to oil and hazmat releases in the water. 
So after, when the nation was responding to 9-11, Coast Guard uh, had the responsibility of port security. And it, what was, what was uh, uh, difficult, could be difficult, right, was that, um, so you had the commanding officer of the Marine Safety Office who had the Captain of the Port Authority for exercising port security, but then the commanding officer of the group had all the surface assets because of the small boat stations and the patrol boats reported to the group commander. So to make it more efficient and to make it less confusing, Sector solved that and combined all the operational authorities under one person, and that's the Sector Commander. And so as Sector Commander, I have um, the Captain of the Port Authority, Search and Rescue Mission Coordinator, Officer in Charge of Marine Inspections, Federal Maritime Security Coordinator, and Federal On-Scene Coordinator. And so for the next couple of slides, I'll discuss what those authorities mean. So as Captain of the Port, I'm responsible for enforcing port safety, port security, and environmental uh, stewardship in the maritime environment. And to achieve that, I have uh, the authority to control vessel movements, establish safety and security zones, and control access to vessels and facilities. These authorities, uh, depending on operational tempo, I'll exercise once a week if I need to um, direct a vessel that they need to address the machinery systems or the life-saving systems and that they're not allowed to depart port unless those uh, equipment is addressed. Another example of Captain of Port Authority is to ensure that large events on the water, such as Sail GP or Fleet Week, are enforced via safety and security zones that then that all of the public understands what, what is expected in uh, the operating environment during those large events. And then given the most recent news with regards to if there were a vessel that wished to call on to port but had, had a report of a suspected case of a coronavirus on board, they're required to report that to the captain of the port. And uh, under my authority, there are certain courses of actions that I can direct to ensure for the safety of the port. And uh, so, for example, if, if the choice is to have the vessel stay off port for a certain amount of time, or that they would be allowed into port, but they wouldn't be able to disembark any uh, passengers until the CDC has gone through their medical screening and protocols. Okay, and we work in conjunction with our federal partners to exercise that. So I'm also responsible for all search and rescue in the maritime environment, and uh, this, uh, so this area of responsibility is the one that we discussed previously uh, north to uh, uh, Gualala Point, south to uh, Salmon Creek Falls. And we run, well, I'll go back to the next slide, but I mean, when we, when we receive a report of a search and rescue case, uh, what will happen is uh, we'll receive those notifications via our command center at Yerba Buena Island. Uh, the command center will evaluate the report and dispatch our stations, our patrol boats, air assets, and then determine the search area and search pattern and coordinate with our state and local partners. And as you know, the weather here is very unpredictable. The water is cold, there's fog, there's tides, there's cross currents. Um, time is not on our side if there's a report of a person in the water. So um, all resources come to bear uh, with regards to Coast Guard is uh, deploying as well as our state and local marine uh, our partners in the, that have marine units to bear. So this is a snapshot of our search and rescue cases where they occur for the past four years. Uh, we run um, more search and rescue cases than any other sector in the Coast Guard because, I mean, it's not just the Bay and the Delta, but of course, Monterey Bay and uh, Lake Tahoe. So in 2019, we ran 1,120 cases and that uh, averages to about three a day. So this is an example of a, of a great case. Uh, December of 18 last year, our command center received a report from the fishing vessel Mandy Jane at approximately 4.45 in the afternoon. And uh, the captain reports that the vessel is taking on water with five persons on board. So of course the command center launches Station Golden Gate, uh, launches Air Station uh, San Francisco, 
as well as our patrol boat, uh, the Sockeye. And then uh, 15 minutes later, the captain uh, reports to our command center that the entire crew is donning survival suits and that they're uh, abandoning ship via their life raft, with the exception of the captain, uh, he's remaining aboard. And so Station Golden Gate is on scene, Air Station uh, San Francisco is on scene, the rescue swimmer is able to trans, is lowered down and then the rescue swimmer is able to assist the four that are in the life raft over to Station Golden Gate's uh, lifeboat. And then uh, when it becomes apparent that the fishing vessel is going to become a complete loss, then the rescue swimmer is able to transition the captain from his fishing vessel to the lifeboat. And so all five lives were saved, but it's very important to note that that fishing vessel crew gave themselves every opportunity to survive in a worst case scenario. Uh, they knew how to down their survival suits. They had the proper training and they had maintained their life rafts and their EPIRBs so that um, when they needed, that they worked when they needed it most, okay? Is officer in charge of marine inspection. So this area of responsibility actually extends all the way up to the California Oregon border. And so the the remaining three, and then I forgot to mention Captain Port also extends to um, the California Oregon border. And so as officer in charge of marine inspections, I'm responsible for ensuring that commercial vessels are inspected uh, in accordance with applicable laws, policies, and regulations. And that includes inspecting vessels for safe manning, operations and construction to ensure vessels are seaworthy, as well as their life-saving and machinery equipment are in proper working order. Um, the intent, right, is to prevent a search and rescue case um, before, uh, you, you know, that the, their systems are working so that we don't need to respond to a search and rescue case. And so this fleet of responsibility includes all the U.S. flag uh, container vessels in our area of responsibility, as well as the ferries and the sightseeing vessels. Um, the Bay Area companies uh, are also employing the use of novel engineering designs, such as lithium ion batteries aboard the ferry in Hydra. So that's a diesel electric uh, propulsion system. There's also currently under construction, the water go round that will use hydrogen fuel cell technology as a means of propulsion and uh, upon its completion, because that's being built here in the Bay Area, it'll be the first commercial ferry of its kind in the entire world. So it's really exciting time for uh, the marine inspectors trained at uh, Coast Guard Sector San Francisco because uh, it's really leading edge here in the Bay Area as far as green technology and uh, for my marine inspectors to get to see to those engineering systems is, uh, is quite the opportunity. And lastly, marine accident investigations are carried out under officer in charge marine inspection authority. And so last year, we had two cases that were referred to the US attorney for criminal prosecution. So the first case was uh, um, on board a foreign vessel, foreign tanker, where the assistant engineer was um, accused of illegal discharge of oily waste. And uh, there was enough evidence that the U.S. attorney was willing to take on the case and uh, prosecute uh, this assistant engineer. And because for one of the discharges, allegedly had occurred only three nautical miles west of the Golden Gate Bridge. And then the second case was a foreign master of a 590-foot tanker and um, uh, suspected of operating his vessel under intoxication, under the um, influence of alcohol. And so with that case, the San Francisco bar pilot uh, reported to the vessel and was scheduled to take the vessel from Anchorage uh, outbound to the sea buoy. And when the bar pilot uh, uh, reported aboard, he could smell the alcohol on the master's breath and then so made the report to um, our command center. So our command center dispatched Station San Francisco, as well as our accident investigators from Sector San Francisco. And Station San Francisco administered three breathalyzer tests. And yes, in fact, the foreign master was intoxicated. And so uh, we transferred the case to the US attorney and the master uh, upon uh, his court hearing did plead guilty to operating that uh, 590 foot uh, foreign tanker under the influence of alcohol. 
As federal, so after 9-11, Captain the Ports were designated as the Federal Maritime Security Coordinator for their Captain the Ports zone, responsible for, responsible for leading the Area Maritime Security Committee to develop and exercise an Area Maritime Security Plan. So you might see uh, members of Sector San Francisco exercising the Area Maritime Security Plan when you see a station small boat escorting any of the cruise ships in and out, in or out from the port as well as uh, providing escort to any of the military shipments moving in and out of Military Ocean Terminal in Concord. You may also see our sector boarding team conducting landside patrols at any of the 14 ferry terminals or at the Alcatraz sightseeing ferry terminal. Uh, they're exercising law enforcement and landside patrols at our waterfront regulated facilities. Okay. And lastly, as federal on-scene coordinator, I direct federal removal efforts at the scene of an oil discharge or hazardous substance release in the maritime environment. We work very closely with California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Office of Spill Prevention and Response and other port partners to develop and execute response in accordance with the area contingency plan. So for example, this is a fishing vessel that ran aground, the, the bottom right uh, picture, that ran aground in Santa Cruz. The vessel broke completely apart, but I was able, you know, I directed the, the responsible party to remove the 200 gallons of diesel because the tanks had survived the high surf. So Sector San Francisco, we are able to meet these uh, extensive missions and responsibilities with um, complete collaboration and partnership with our federal uh, agencies, state, and local. So we enjoy um, this uh, very positive and healthy interagency collaboration here in, in Northern California. And so we achieve that through the Harbor Safety Committee who are focused on uh, safe navigation in the port. Our area committee previously discussed with regards to oil and hazmat spill response, area maritime security committee, uh, those first three committees are open to the public and you'll see that through um, uh, on the internet as far as when those are publicly open. And then um, we also rely heavily as we discuss as far as search and rescue in these cold waters on the fire department, the local fire departments with their marine units. And then for Neptune Coalition and carrying out security and law enforcement on the water is the police department and their, their marine units. So I just like to end my presentation here. You know, uh, this is a kind of snapshot of uh, some of the members of Sector San Francisco who I am privileged to serve as their sector commander and who work extremely hard to ensure the public is well served by your Coast Guard here in Northern California. So thank you for your time and your interest in learning about how we contribute to the community and to the success of the Bay Area and national economy. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from St. Francis Yacht Club. We have as our guest today, a Sector Commander, San Francisco Bay Area, Marie Bird. Marie, holy cow, what a big territory from Oregon to San Luis Obispo and east to Utah. Um, who do you report to? Okay, so um, my supervisor is Admiral Godier. for those who might have seen him in the community or out and about through Fleet Week. So. Um, if you're familiar with the Coast Guard in the Bay Area, uh, most are familiar with Coast Guard Island in Alameda, and that's where um, the two-star admiral for District 11, which is Admiral Godier, and he's responsible for all Coast Guard operations in the state of California. And then his supervisor is also stationed at Coast Guard Island, which is the Pacific Area Commander, and she's a three-star admiral, Admiral Fagan, and she's responsible for our, everything from the Rocky Mountains west to the Far East. Now, I'm going to keep asking questions, but Mikkel's going to have stand up over here with a mic. And if you have a question, please put your hand up. Mikkel will bring you the mic. <clears throat> so, Marie, this is an amazingly large territory with lots and lots of activities. Tell us, what is your single biggest worry? 
Um, I think that um, for each sector commander, you you know, we have our uh, Coast Guard, ex, you know, responsibilities as, as regards to safety, security, and stewardship. But for each sector commander, there's unique uh, threats in their port. And so for Sector San Francisco, that's uh, very clearly earthquake preparedness and how we're supporting the community of emergency responders at the, at the onset of um, saving lives. Uh, so whether that means transporting uh, first responders from East Bay to San Francisco or, or vice versa, depending on which fault has been activated. Uh, and then as far as uh, ensuring now after the initial uh, response of safety, you know, the saving lives is ensuring the marine transportation system uh, is, uh, in, is recovered, port recovery efforts, so that we can get emergency supplies in uh, via, via maritime. So earthquake preparedness. And then um, the second one I, is absolutely the, the, our ferry system here. Uh, so there's 14 ferry terminals between the 10 from Weta and the four from Golden Gate Ferries and uh, just ensuring the safety of those passengers as, as with all that, uh, that movement. So if we were, if I see a question, put your hand up, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, you can ask a question. Aha, Angus Blackwood, president of the Navy League right off the bat. Yes, Angus. Uh, Captain Berg, thanks for coming out today and thanks for your life of public service. Can you discuss the uh, full of your pay grade at this point, but the, the fiscal uh, position of the Coast Guard, uh, in particular, uh, the uh, ice cutters that uh, you've needed for a long time, some of the pilfering of Coast Guard funds uh, by other parts of the federal government, and the impact of the government shutdown on Coast Guard personnel. Good question, Angus. We'd expect the question from the president of the Navy League. <laughs> Um, That's three questions. Yes. Yes. So, um, so the first one, uh, I think that it's been uh, outstanding with regards to, um, uh, our, you know, for the congressional budget to uh, the United States Coast Guard with regards to the recapitalization of our cutter fleet. Uh, so our icebreakers, I mean, uh, um, the Arctic is uh, is in 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 that space is. Uh, you know, the United States, but then also China has their icebreakers as well as Russia. And uh, so for the United States to only have one uh, where we need to establish a uh, presence is, is just not enough. And so the fact that uh, Congress has um, committed, I believe we have one and a second one that's been fully funded or, or to that progress is absolutely a step in the right direction, but not just only the icebreakers, but all of the cutters that you would that you're not going. They won't be at Yorba Buena Island. They'll be at Coast Guard Island. Our high endurance cutters and our offshore patrol cutters. All of those um, need to be recapitalized, and so we appreciate that support. Um, I'm going to defer on the second one as far as like where you know if that money is being re-racked from another agency to the next. I just do appreciate the the support that is being addressed with regards to the recapitalization for Coast Guard cutters, and then. Um, the third one with regards to government shutdown, uh, that was a very difficult situation as we were the only, I think a lot of people don't realize the Coast Guard is an armed service and one of the five armed services is confusing because we're not in Department of Defense. Um, and so, and that was by design because we have posse comitatus authority and you can't be in DOD in order to exercise that. But um, so we were the only armed service that uh, was affected and, um, I'll just say that as far as for the community, wow. I mean, I know St. Francis Yacht Club opened their doors for um, my affected team. Uh, and each of the stations uh, from Golden Gate, Monterey, Dega Bay, Tahoe, communities opened their doors. And uh, it was in a very difficult time for my most junior of members, you know, um, you know non-rates, se uh, seamen where and firemen where, you know, it's not, this is not, a, this is a very expensive place to live. So just to put gas in your car to get to work, right, is, um, uh, it's just, it was just difficult. So we appreciate the support from the community. Yes, Walter, Crump has a question. Walter. Yeah, uh, thank you for coming to speak to us. I appreciate it. Uh, in Richardson Bay, there are a lot of groups called anchor outs. You probably have heard them referred to as that. There are probably 350 or more. Are you doing anything uh, 
to, uh, and most of them are unregistered, et cetera. Uh, their, their boats are in bad shape and there's a lot of uh, drug se se uh, selling going on in some of them. And I just wondered, uh, are you doing anything to reduce the, the number of uh, people out there that we can get off the water and off to some other place? Thank you. Right. So, I mean, with regards to Richardson Bay, right, if there is any situation where our law enforcement authorities and we have exercised those with regards to if uh, when our station is conducted their uh, law enforcement boardings with regards to uh, use of, rec you know, use of drugs or boating under intoxication of, or influence of drugs. So where we have carried out those authorities, if they become a, a pollution threat, uh, also exercising the authorities of federal on-scene coordinator. But when it becomes an, an abandoned or derelict vessel situation, which is, I don't have uh, authorities with under those uh, uh, circumstances, then it's working with the Army Corps of Engineer, where if they have become a hazard to navigation, the Army Corps is able to ensure that uh, um, that they're able to dispose of it. But where where we have authority to affect to save lives, uh, when there's uh, high wind events that uh, when the wind turns and they're actually pushed outside of Richardson Bay, it's a very busy day for Station Golden Gate, Station San Francisco, our sector. Command Center. Walter has mentioned that he's had a few people drown in the South St. Richardson Bay area. Okay. And um, I mean, I, I think that anytime we have a, any effect of, are they are do those reports come into a command center that there's a person in the water? Because I know that for. Um, right. I mean. Sir, as, as we know, if, if we're, we're mm -hmm. yes, sir, uh, we, we run, um, not every case is a successful case, and we do, we, along with our um, partners in our search and rescue councils, work to effect um, a rescue every, every time, every single day, every single time. I see Gordon Daniels has a question, and then Mikhail, uh Bill has a question in the back of the room, too. There's some other ones back there. Okay, Gordon. Hi, I really appreciate your talk. And I wanted to recommend a movie that shows what the Coast Guard does. It's uh, Finest Hours. And it was about the greatest his, uh, rescue where a 30-foot small boat got 26 guys off of a broken-up freighter. We got them back into Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And I was kind of curious as to the how it's been upgraded. I think I saw a picture of a similar boat on the slides that can go through surf or a breaking, uh, breaking waters like that. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit about how that's how those boats, uh, what they are now compared to what they used to be? Right. I mean, uh, so the, mo the motor lifeboat, that's the pinnacle. If you're going to be the coxswain of a small boat station to earn your surfman pin and the um, qualification to drive that boat, it's a very long process. Uh, it ranges, but I think on average, seven years, seven years to earn that qualification. And uh, Station Bodega Bay and Station Golden Gate are, are uh, uh, labeled surf stations and they really of all the surf stations and I'll speak to the west coast is those are very competitive ones to be at because traditionally surf stations are at very remote areas along the coast of Washington and Oregon and uh, so for the motor lifeboat and when you see them uh, conducting their training it is it's a uh, it's just uh, it's pretty it's pretty badass what those guys do. I mean, I'm sorry to, you know, I, I don't know any other word to describe it. And uh, and uh, the National Motor Lifeboat School is right here at on the West Coast at Cape Disappointment. Our officer in charge at Station Bodega Bay was an instructor at the Motor Lifeboat School. It's, um, it is, it's, it's very impressive. And we were very lucky. There was a photographer who happened to um, catch Station Golden Gate doing surf training and uh, those pictures went viral, and it went it uh, ran on USA Today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Bill Haberset has a question. Bill. Yeah, thank you for your very interesting talk. I had two questions. Um, I know from personal experience that it, when you sail in the middle of the night into San Diego, Sector San Diego, that they are watching you um, for the purpose of who's coming in and the, and the border enforcement. Uh, that they focus on and they send people out to inspect who's on the boat and things like that. 
Uh, to what extent does the border enforcement or ICE enforcement, uh, does that fall into your jurisdiction? And is that this far north, does that take up much of your, um, your operations up here? The second question is, Ron referred to a, some incident where a container ship had a bomb in the, in the hold and was trying to come into the port. I didn't know that story, but could you relate that story? No, no. I said, what if? Who's in oh. charge? <laughs> Who would save us if? Who's preventing it? They've clearly done a good enough job so that it's a what if question. <laughs> uh, so... I mean, that's a very, um, like, as we discussed with regards to what are the unique threats uh, for Sector San Francisco, and that's earthquakes and our and our extensive ferry system. For the Sector San Diego's captain of the port, I would, I would say that his, that unique threat of his proximity to um, uh, where they would need to have uh, that kind of stance with regards to uh, traffic in and out of the port of San Diego, and they, they're actually deploying resources to confirm who's aboard. I would say would be unique to the sector San Diego, but with regards to our interagency work with uh, CBP and uh, uh, our federal partners, so Yorba Buena Island is an interagency operations center. We do have a member of CBP from the marine operations side who works and is a liaison at our sector, and um, it is it's it's um, it's a very valuable partnership when. Uh, uh, we can depend on each other, and, and there's nothing like when you're seeing that person every day. Question from Lynn Monroe. Lynn. Uh, you may have mentioned this, but how far, how many miles out is your jurisdiction from the coast? Yes, ma'am. So it extends 200 nautical miles seaward. Okay, great. And the other thing on those ships, are they allowed to discharge any kind of sewage or bilge pump thing out in the ocean? Yes, they are. Mm, that's too bad. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's been wonderful hearing you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Next question from Beth Dietley. Thank you, Beth. Um, uh, what is your responsibility for all the takers that come in, in terms of them sitting out there and coming in, and the and the, um, the the oh the other the other ships that offload goods and materials? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So annually, the Coast Guard has to inspect. Any vessel that uh, that is within the Port State Control Program, or if it's a U.S. flag vessel, um, they will receive a certificate of inspection. So we're going on board at least annually to confirm that their machinery systems work, their life-saving, um, any of their cargo operations. Because again, we don't want there to be an accident right in the middle of the channel, and then that shuts down the channel. Um, we don't want to have them spill oil in our in our waters and so th those uh those annual inspections uh in a, in for a foreign vessel within the entire port state control system because they're also receiving the same annual inspections from other port state control authorities if they're calling on at, into china or to france or etc <laughs> So, Marie, when I was a boy, we didn't wear life jackets, and we also didn't have anything imaginable like the little cool EPIRBs we have now. What's the path by which an EPIRB signal, if it goes off, let's say, by the Fairlawns, what's the path by which it gets to you guys? Where does the EPIRB signal go, and how long does it take? Right, so we'll either, um, depending on how far um, that, that EPIRB signal is going, it'll traditionally come into the district command center at uh, Coast Guard Island, and then... Uh, they will, they because their resources, like we have to ask permission from district to launch Air Station Sacramento, but district will, has, you know, that's a district asset, and then they'll launch on Air Station Sacramento. Or if uh, um, the district command center wants to pass it to sectors command center for lead uh, prosecution, then we will take it over. So a dozen years or so, a boat that many of us know, and I actually spent 10,000 ocean racing miles on, called Low Speed Chase, uh, in the presence of a, a skipper, a paid skipper, uh, was lost at the Fairlawns. And uh, young friends of ours passed away, five of them. And um, having been on the boat as recently as like three years before the accident, I knew the boat was pretty together boat. How long should it have taken for a helicopter to get 
from dispatch to the fair lawns if you chose to use that method? How long does it take to get a chopper out there? Is this a 10 minute operation? Is this an hour? How long does it take for you guys to get muster one out there? Right. I mean, I, so now I would just be, uh, cause the, the technicals of it, but I mean, I'm thinking out to the Gulf of Farallons from air station, uh, San Francisco upon notification to the command center launching air station. I mean, the, would it take 40 minutes for the crew, depending on the time of night, it took the time day of day, time. right? Okay. Day time to get there to launch and be on scene. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, cause the, I'm guessing here and I would think 40 minutes and, uh, but I can confirm with the commanding officer of the hell. The so those of yeah. us who've been I say, in the ocean, it's happy. I mean, it's nice for you to know. You can't expect to, you know, it's like not calling an Uber or anything like that. They've got to muster. They've got to decide they want to send a helicopter because many people said after that particular accident, gee, a copter should have gotten here in 10 minutes. But you don't send choppers just out like that. You have to basically go through. What's the process? Had you heard about the accident and none of them had EPIRBs on? Had you heard about the accident from another boat? How long would it have taken you to decide to dispatch a rescue vehicle? Right, so it takes time, uh, first of all, for the the, team, the helicopter crew to get up and going and for their equipment to, How long? I mean, I think it's within 30 minutes that that is our, our uh, standard uh, policy. And then to get out to the Farallons, uh, remind me again I, how many miles that would, that would be. So uh, it's, I think that the, the most important thing to take from this is we're first responders. This is our job. There's no um, uh, dilly-dallying if there's a person in the water or there's folks in distress. I mean, this is why people join the Coast Guard. So, uh, but there is that time, speed, distance uh, um, reality that, that no matter how quickly and how fast we want to get there, I mean, a lot of it, as, as I was describing with regards to that fishing vessel cases, um, uh, there are certain risks that people are taking when they're uh, uh, enjoying this uh, um, kind of uh, activity. And so it, it's a shared responsibility. But uh, trust me when I say, I mean, that, that this is why our people join this service. And, uh, and, and uh, there's, there's any delay is not anything that they're, that they're purposefully trying to do. They're, they're, they're going, getting out there as quickly as possible. So Gordon Danielson, who's a pilot, says that a fast helicopter would take about 50 minutes to get there. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? Yes, Miguel. Could you comment on the day-to-day uh, -day controls on the entrance of foreign freighters into the bay and the subsequent docking? That's a good question. Okay, so the day-to-day -day control. So uh, there is a vessel traffic, uh, our vessel traffic service, so they, they'll have to check in with them and give their intentions and at every at, at certain points along their journey uh, they're checking in but when I am very uh, uh, pleased and and grateful we have a very uh, healthy relationship with the bar pilots uh, our VTS was the very first VTS established in the US and uh, BTS explain. our vessel traffic service and established in 1972 and uh, uh, our VTS watch standards and the San Francisco PAR pilots are like, you know, very tight. And uh, uh, to the, 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 they'll know who our um, watch standards are. And if we have a new one, they're always uh, uh, giving us feedback and, uh, and in, in a positive way, because we all want the same thing. And, uh, you know, safety, security, and stewardship in the, in the maritime environment. And so, um, and then, a, a local state regulation after Costco Busan was that every uh, oil tanker or chemical tanker will be will have a tug escort, and so you'll see that as well. So, if we were to take the pie of all the service you perform, and say pie-shaped slices, how much of your energy goes to recreational boating, fishing, all of the commercial, 
and criminal what, of your responsibility. Which is the biggest uh, area of responsibility or activity? What do you spend the most of your activity? Recreational, fishing, commercial, or criminal? And if anything else that I missed it. Yeah. Or and did you want to add search and rescue? Search and rescue. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think it uh, it's really operational dependent, but uh, I would say on average, um, yeah, we run the most search and rescue cases out of any sector in the Coast Guard, uh, and so. I mean, that's is it be 30 percent like, of your responsibility 30 percent of your activity is right. it two percent of your activity? no i would almost say it's of the four choices it's 50 percent right so it's maybe 40 to 50 percent or is it 40 percent on uh, search and rescue and then the other 60 percent between those three pieces 20 percent recreational 20 percent fisheries 20 percent uh criminal but it, it's a i mean uh, in this area of responsibility, and, and then, in, of course, including Tahoe, Monterey, and uh, Bodega Bay, people want to be out on the water. And, and then there's also that false sense of security that, oh, well, I'm not out in the ocean, I'm just in the bay. And then, you know, people don't realize uh, um, how quickly the temperature changes from the day to the evening. Um, Fourth of July, there's a lot of folks that come in inland that want to enjoy the fireworks on the water, and but then don't come prepared for that. You know, they the you know they're out all day and it's hot, but then at night, you know, it's it's cold, and um, and then when you add you know um, uh, alcohol uh, to that, it's just a dangerous combination. We have another question from the audience. I thank you for the very intriguing and informative uh, uh, presentation. You've made my Wednesday. Thank you. Um, question I had is around like youth engagement and awareness and uh, I'm actually uh, actually with um, uh, Ron, he's one of our trustees. Uh, we advocate for the Maritime National Parks. Uh, we try to engage the broader community. Um, and I'm just really curious, um, what opportunities are there for like youth and folks to engage with the Coast Guard and learn about the careers and different options or you know, if that's even um, if it's already going or if there's plans to do that i'm just curious to hear uh, what you're doing in that area yeah cool idea yeah, no thank you for the kind reminds, remarks and thanks for the question because uh, when you mentioned sea scouts and uh, and that's still a very strong uh organization and uh, so the sea scouts um they'll there, there's certain chapters that meet at yerba buena island and so i know that you know they're exposed to coast guard just because they see it as part of their uh their routine, and then, but every year we hold a Sea Scouts annual, um, uh, almost like a safety stand down, and uh, it was really great. Where uh, last summer, the, the one of the Sea Scouts boats, we had, you know, there was a report of a person in the water, and we had Station Golden Gate out looking and helicopter out looking, but it was the Sea Scout Good Sam that found the person in the water. And it was that, I mean, you, you, I mean, that the Sea Scouts, I mean, uh, they, they, we, we gave them a public service award that the, the four on that crew, just because that, that's just an amazing thing. And uh, so we're very active in our community. I mean, we do partnership and education where members of our team will go out to the community and, you know, read with folks at school. They'll see my team in their uniform, then they'll generally uh, want to ask questions. Girls on the run come to Sector San Francisco and we'll uh, show them our missions, have them visit our patrol boats, go see our command center and vessel traffic service. We're, um, you know, the, the vitality of our organization uh, requires that and for and for opportunities like this where um, our community knows and they're talking to you know their nieces and nephews and grandchildren and uh, we appreciate that and I want to remind our members and uh, Marie that on Monday night football nights when us members cook dinner uh, for each other um, Coast Guard members are always invited to be hosted by the St. Francis Yacht Club in this room. So please remind them that they're always welcome to come uh, and we'll ask them to take a smile and wave a hand, but uh, on us uh, to come and have dinner with us on Monday nights during Monday Night Football. Bruce Monroe has a question. Yes, this is uh, two questions from the Monroe thank, family. Thank you, Captain Bird. Very interesting. Um, those of us who are active sailors, 
we really do appreciate knowing that the Coast Guard's out there if we need it. But one area that you have not mentioned that as small boaters, we're very aware of, and that is the maintenance and establishment of navigational aids around the bay and out in the ocean. Would you care to comment on the Coast Guard's responsibility for maintaining navigational aids? Yes, and um, no, so I mean, because, you know, with 13 subunits and, and it's hard because 30 minutes goes by very fast when you're talking about sector San Francisco. So um, when I was uh, kind of discussing, you know, what's co-located uh, at Yerba Buena Island, that's where the ACE navigation team is. And, uh, and so they're responsible for about a thousand uh, aids in our area of responsibility. Um, of course, the buoys, but the fixed aids, but what's really the interesting part is that it also includes the lighthouses, right? And so a lot of people don't realize, you know, what was the first lighthouse on the West Coast? Alcatraz? So it was, it was Alcatraz. It was supposed to be the Farallons, but then um, when the lens got shipped from France, it was too large. And uh, so, and they either had the choice of, you know, so they had to um, send that lens back and get a smaller one. And so in that delay, then Alcatraz ended up being the first lighthouse. But uh, so the team that, that do ACE and navigation um, traditionally tend to stay in that career path. Not, not always, but you know, it's a very specific uh, um, qualification set. And so they're the ones that instead of doing the small boat station with the traditional search and rescue and law enforcement, uh, that's their role, that's what they devote their uh, career qualifications to, and uh, they have uh, a really, I mean, just gorgeous area of responsibility. I mean, Point Sur Lighthouse, Point Bonita, Alcatraz, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, the, the interesting one over at uh, Mile okay. Rock. Like Mile Rock, uh, they, you know, that, that, it was difficult to extract our ACE to navigation team once the fog rolled in, because they can only get there um, via the helicopter because it's a, uh, so it was, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great mission. When and where was the Coast Guard founded? So we, if you've watched uh, Hamilton, so the father of the Coast Guard revenue cutter service. So 1792, August 4th and, uh, and uh, started with a few, uh, sentinel cutters to enforce for um, customs and revenue and taxes. And uh, uh, so longest uninterrupted seagoing service. Wonderful. Yes. Follow-up question, Bruce. You know, just to follow up on the aids to navigation, <laughs> the lighthouses, one of the most famous and near and dear to our heart is the lighthouse that used to be on Southampton Shoal and now sits on our island, Tinsley Island, up in the Delta. Thank you to the Coast Guard for selling that to us <laughs> 60 or 70 years ago. For, wow. for one dollar, for one dollar. <laughs> so, um, Walter is mentioning there's oh, a great okay. photo of Southampton Shoal Lighthouse, which is right outside the entrance to our grill room here. Please join me in welcoming and saying thank you to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon Speaker, uh, the Commander of San Francisco Sector of the U.S. Coast Guard, Captain Marie Bird. Thank you so much, Marie, for joining us. Thank you. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned.